Thanks everyone for the chance to present to you today. Uh, I'm Jerry Pfeffer. I'm a clinician researcher here at University of Calgary and have been uh, doing some research with uh, my colleagues in the ALS clinic for some years now. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the microbiome and ALS and give you a little introduction to some of the work uh, that we've been doing. So firstly, I should probably explain what is the microbiome. Uh, the microbiome is basically this, this ensemble of microorganisms that are living on or within our organs. So it includes bacteria, viruses, archaea, fungi, and so on. And they live all over us. Uh, they live on our skin, in our lungs, in our gastrointestinal tract. And uh, that's why I like this figure, because it kind of represents that a little bit here, you know, in, in the mouth, in the stomach, in the GI tract, in the lungs. And the other thing that's shown nicely in this figure is that you have different types of organisms in different locations. So that's what happens in the microbiome of different parts of the body as well. The composition varies uh, by, by its location. And the microbiome is really important. Uh, because it performs a number of different metabolic and immune functions. All of these different organisms, they are coming into contact with the things that we eat and drink, and they are uh, changing them chemically in some way or another, sometimes favorably, sometimes unfavorably. And the existence of all these microorganisms can have a protective role uh, when bad infections try to come into the system, uh, they can be outcompeted, or if your microbiome isn't functioning well, maybe it becomes favorable for an infection to occur. So all this is to say it's increasingly recognized that the microbiome has an important association with health and disease. And it's not just a matter of all these microorganisms hitching a ride on us, uh, because some studies show that there are about four times the number of microorganisms colonizing us than there are cells in our body. So maybe it's us hitching a ride with them. Now we know from early research that microbiome alterations occur uh, in ALS. And in this figure over here, which is a little bit hard to interpret with the naked eye, it shows you the general distribution of all these different species of bacteria, which are the focus of this paper, between healthy controls and ALS participants. And although it's hard to see from this picture, uh, the general uh, picture uh, shows that there is a reduction in the diversity of the organisms in ALS patients compared to controls. Now that's a common theme in microbiome research where the diversity of the microbiome seems to be generally protective. Within that same research, they were able to show that acromancia and some of its metabolites appeared to be uh, protective uh, against uh, ALS. Uh, so in this uh, figure, they're showing nicotinamide, which is one of the uh, metabolites uh, processed by the acromancia bacteria. There's a higher level in blood. And when you look in the CSF, uh, there's quite, quite a bit higher level in the healthy controls. Uh, compared to the ALS participants. So this is some of the early evidence that we see so far in humans that is really showing a potential connection between all of these organisms in our guts and uh, conditions such as ALS. Now for our part, uh, we were interested whether uh, other areas of the microbiome could be relevant to ALS as well. These previous studies were done using the intestinal microbiome. So they were doing uh, bacterial sequencing from poo. Um, perhaps as a matter of convenience, we did not want to work with poo in our lab. So we had the idea uh, to look at the oral microbiome instead. And again, the oral microbiome contains all the same things that are present in the intestinal or the skin or the lung microbiome but just in different proportions because it's a different environment. And what we know is a nice, healthy, diverse microbiome seems to be protective, 
But when it becomes unbalanced, uh, prior research tells us that a number of different diseases, ranging from heart disease to gum disease to neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer disease, can all be associated with changes in that microbi microbial environment. There, there was also some circumstantial evidence that we saw in the literature. Uh, from this paper, they're showing us uh, brain tissue from patients with ALS, where they did staining uh, for different uh, bacterial components within neurons. And the neuronal nuclei are shown here in blue. And in the different colors, they have different stains for bacteria. And normally, there should not be bacteria in the brain. It's normally supposed to be a very clean place. But they were able to show evidence of bacterial DNA within uh, neurons of uh, some participants with ALS. It wasn't many, but a proportion did. And from DNA sequencing, they were able to show that some of these organisms are common in the mouth. So that is some circumstantial evidence suggesting that perhaps there's something happening in the microbial environment that is affecting the brain. So that led us to perform the following uh, study in which, uh, which was done here at the ALS clinic, and some of you uh, may have been participants in this study. Uh, and uh, thank you to those of you who were. Uh, so what we did was we asked uh, people with ALS and their household family members to provide saliva samples. And what we did with those saliva samples is we did DNA sequencing. And then we use a computer algorithm to tell us which bacteria are present in the sample. And we also collected some clinical information about you know, what, what were the characteristics about uh, that person's uh, condition. And right now we're at the stage where uh, these data are in analysis. But I have some preliminary information that I can share with you today. So in total, we included 106 participants. Uh, most of them were from the ALS clinic here in Calgary. Uh, but we also had participant participation from one of our collaborators in Seoul, Korea. Uh, and they recruited 30 participants uh, for this study as well, uh, whose results are also included. And to summarize some of the early data, this figure at the left is showing us the number of millions of reads per sample that were seen on average. It might look like a lot. It's around one and a half million reads per sample. But actually, for this kind of study, that is a little bit on the low side. So we're doing this sequencing again using a different method. That's why we're not 100% confident with the results so far, but uh, I will show you what the general graph looks like. This is referred to as a volcano plot, where we plot the prevalence of all the different organisms on a graph. And anything that's here in the middle is at a similar level between the two groups. And anything that's shifted over to the right is more present in ALS participants. Anything more present to the left in control participants. And anything that's high up is increasingly statistically significant, so unlikely to occur by chance. And so what we see here is that there are a couple of organisms that are very close to significance in, that are increased in the control participants compared to ALS patients. In a way that shouldn't be too surprising because we know that a more diverse microbiome is generally uh, protective. And what it's showing us is that there seem to be uh, some organisms which may be protective in controls that for whatever reason are not present in ALS or less present in ALS participants. So I haven't put the names because it still needs to be validated with a second sequencing method. But we do preliminarily have these interesting results. The other type of analysis that we did was looking at the differences between people from the same household. And in this graph, we're showing the Simpson alpha diversity uh, calculation, where if, the, if it's higher up on the graph, it's more complex. 
If it's lower on the graph, it's less complex. And what we've done is we've plotted the controls in red and the ALS participants in green. And where we have them connected by a line, these are people from the same household. So although it's a small sample size, what we can see is in general the ALS participants are falling in lower diversity than the control participants. Uh, so we're hoping again to have that validated and complete the analysis in more participants, but preliminarily it's showing us something interesting about the oral microbiome in ALS. At the time that we were analyzing this study, somebody else published uh, a paper looking at oral microbiome, and they found something rather interesting. They had included control participants as well as people with spinal onset ALS, meaning with onset in the limbs, and bulbar onset ALS, so with origin in the head and neck muscles. And this is an analysis called a principal components analysis, which tells us uh, whether you can differentiate a group by its characteristics, is the uh, oversimplified way of explaining it. And you can see that the control and spinal ALS groups overlap with each other. However, uh, the bulbar ALS uh, participants, uh, you can really separate them out fairly neatly from everybody else. So there is, uh, again, some strong suggestion there that there is something happening in the oral microbiome that may be especially relevant to bulbar onset ALS, meaning ALS starting in the same muscular region. It's very, very interesting that that should be the case. So I hope to report more details from that study uh, in the future as we get more results. But I also wanted to briefly mention a future study that we'll be recruiting for here in Calgary uh, starting in the next month or two. Uh, and this is a three country study, so we will be recruiting uh, here in Calgary uh, as well as uh, in Israel and Turkey. And in this study, we're going to do a more comprehensive analysis. We're still going to be collecting the clinical data except with more detail. We'll again be collecting saliva samples, but we'll also be collecting blood samples and we will collect the poo samples. And I, I know that probably makes uh, some people, including myself, feel a little bit uncomfortable. But let's be honest, we throw poo away at no charge every day. And hopefully it's the kind of thing that people will see the value in contributing to this research. So um, that, uh, that all being said, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone who participated in this research and made it possible and thank our funding sources. Uh, and thanks all of you for your attention. Uh, I have this cheeky questions slide, but I think we're reserving questions for the very end. So thank you.